Hello everybody and welcome to today's video analysing the poem Homing by Liz Berry. You can download a free worksheet to accompany this video through following the link in the description. Liz Berry is an award-winning poet from the Black Country, a region in the West Midlands of England known for, among other things, its distinctive dialect and industrial history. Homing is taken from Berry's debut collection of poetry, Black Country, described in the blurb as full of the rich dialect of the West Midlands, which is exactly what we find in today's poem. I was fortunate enough to interview Liz Berry about this poem, I'll link that video in the description, and in the interview, Liz explained what inspired the writing of Homing. And so I wrote Homing after my nan died. She had a really beautiful, strong black country voice. And to me, it was just one of the best sounds on earth, really warm and tender, funny, poetic, but also really inextricably linked to these feelings of home and belonging. And when my nan died, I was in my 20s and I was just starting to write seriously, to take my work seriously. And suddenly I looked at all these poems I was writing, all these poems I was reading, and I asked myself, where were voices like my nan's voice, these beautiful voices? Where were voices like my mum's voice, like my sister's voice? Where were voices like my voice? And I couldn't find them anywhere. And so I wanted to start making work that really celebrated those black country women's voices, those vernacular words, and to see what happened when you brought the sort of the vernacular of the West Midlands into lyric poetry. Now, if you're studying this poem as part of the AQA Worlds and Lives cluster, you might want to focus your analysis on the way the world affects people's lives. In that way, we can say that Homing explores the lasting impact of the black country on the speaker, heightened through the pressure felt to abandon their heritage and way of speaking. In terms of belonging, which is another key word in this cluster, we can say that true belonging and connection are only found in embracing your heritage. Let's start by taking a look at the poem read for us by Liz Berry. Homing. For years, you kept your accent in a box beneath the bed. The lock crusted shut by hours of elocution. How now, brown cow? The teacher's ruler across your legs. You heard it escape sometimes. A guttural up. Oh. On the phone to your sister, saft or blot, to a taxi driver unpacking your bags from his boot. I loved its thick drawl, jeez that rang. Clearing your house, the only thing I wanted was that box, Jemmy Dalpen, to let years of lost words spill out. Bibble, fiddle. Tie, warm, veils ferrous as nails, consonants you could lick the coal from. I wanted to swallow them all, the pits, railways, factories thunking and clanging the night shift. The red brick back to back you were born in. I wanted to forge your voice in my mouth, a blacksmith's furnace. Shout it from the roofs, send your words, like pigeons, fluttering for home. So in Homing, we see the speaker addressing a loved one who has died. The speaker's clearing the loved one's house, sorting through their possessions, and more than anything, they want to open a box which has been hidden under the bed, the lock rusted shut. In this box is stored the loved one's regional black country dialect, which has been suppressed. They'd been taught in lessons to suppress the accent, but the speaker points out how it slipped out on various occasions. The speaker wants to open the box and swallow the words hidden within it, then shout them from the rooftops. Now, obviously, all of this is metaphorical, the metaphor symbolising how the speaker wants to reconnect with their roots and heritage that have been suppressed. It's actually what we call a conceit, which is an extended metaphor that continues throughout an entire poem. 
As we see in many poems by Liz Berry, homing contains numerous examples of West Midlands vernacular. By vernacular, we mean the language or dialect spoken by people in a specific region, in this country, the black country of the West Midlands in England. Examples include saft, blart, bibble, fiddle, tay and wum. You might be unfamiliar with these terms, just as I was, so here are their meanings. Saft means silly, blart means cry, Bibble means pebble or small stone, fiddle means food, tay means tea, wum means home. These are the words the speaker wants to free from the box, and if you've watched my other videos on this cluster, you'll know that the modern poems are described as being rooted in the revolutionary spirit of the Romantics, and you might remember from my video on lines written in early spring that Wordsworth, one of the main figures of the Romantic movement, explained a key part of Romantic poetry. The principal object was to choose incidents and situations from common life and to relate or describe them throughout as far as was possible in a selection of language really used by men. And when I asked Liz Berry about how her poem fits into the revolutionary spirit of the Romantics, she explained... And so I hope that's what Harmin celebrates, this extraordinariness of, of ordinary, everyday language. And I think I also how the poem tries, as words were tried sort of very radically back in his day, to bring the poet's language nearer to the language of man. Or yeah. I suppose in my case, the language of women. <laughs> so when we see the use of the black country vernacular, we can analyse it as a way of bringing ordinary everyday language into poetry and connect it to the romantics. But we can also consider the effect on the reader. To many of us, these words will be unfamiliar, and so through their usage in the poem, Berry is inviting us into her own world and life, which is of course what this whole cluster of poems is about. Berry asked, where are voices like my nan's voice, these beautiful voices, and uses this poem to celebrate and elevate these voices, and to encourage us as readers to do the same. One way she achieves this is through the use of structure in the poem. Take a look at line four, how now brown cow. Now this is an example of the pronunciation the person was taught in elocution lessons. Essentially what that means is that they had lessons in how to speak in what is called received pronunciation, an English accent also known as the Queen's English. It's an accent associated with the upper classes. How now brown cow is a phrase often used in teaching this standard English pronunciation. The person being addressed then was taught to abandon their own way of speaking and to adopt received pronunciation by a teacher who seemingly hit them with a ruler if they didn't get it right. There are three things to say about this line. Number one, it's made up of four words. Two, it's written in italics. And three, it's presented in a separate line of its own. And there's one other line in the poem which is presented in the same way. Bibble, fiddle, te, wum. Again, four words in italics on a line of their own. So structurally, the mirroring of the two lines forces us to consider how received pronunciation and regional dialect are equal. There's nothing better about one over the other. The italics, also used for other dialect words in the poem, makes these words stand out, just as the black country dialect stands out from the way other people speak. But this is something to celebrate, not suppress. The title of the poem, Homing, ties in with the last two lines, send your words like pigeons fluttering for home. The reference here is to homing pigeons, birds which find their way home over long distances. This comparison at the end of the poem indicates how words can act like bridges, linking us with our past and with the people and places we love. It's a strikingly similar image to that of the final stanza of Seni Seneveratni's A Wider View, where place bridges the gap between the speaker with their great-great-great-granddad. If we think of the title of Homing as the start of the poem, we could say that it starts and ends with imagery related to homing pigeons, and this structural decision emphasises the significance of the image. But what is Berry saying? Well, again, in her own words... I wanted to make that link between someone leaving their birthplace, leaving their language, leaving the accent, perhaps moving far away from it, but then being brought back again, being brought back home by language, by these gorgeous vernacular words. And I suppose the love and identity that they represent. So yeah, the pigeon just seemed the perfect symbol for both the region and for that, that sort of being pulled back by language. 
So in terms of the cluster heading worlds, the symbol of homing pigeons reflects how language can create a bridge which connects the world of our past and the world of today. In terms of lives, we can see how our lives might take us away from our heritage, but we're inevitably drawn back. Finally, let's consider how these vernacular words are described from line 15 onwards. Vowels ferrous as nails, consonants you could lick the coal from, the pits, railways, factories, the red brick, back to back, blacksmith's furnace. All of these examples paint a picture of a world filled with tough physical work during the Industrial Revolution, and by using these images, Berry shows the toughness of the people who worked in these situations. She makes the local language seem as important as the history that shaped the place by linking it to these images. Again, if you've been watching the videos in this series, you'll have seen how a number of poems present a dislike of the urban industrial world. We saw in England in 1819 how the fields were untilled because of the mass migration to cities. We saw in a wider view how cholera was a significant issue in Leeds and other industrial cities during the mid-19th century, how the rapid population growth due to industrialization led to overcrowding, poor sanitation and unsafe housing conditions which contributed to the spread of diseases like cholera. But here in Homing we see how the industrial past is an integral part of the black country way of life and how the speaker loves it because of that very reason. Liz Berry explained, The black country was the birthplace of the industrial revolution and went on to become one of the most heavily industrialised regions in all of Britain. So it feels impossible to write about roots in the black country without drawing upon that imagery that language as it's so important and definitive to the area. And this is a key point in the poem. The industrial world has all but disappeared now. The factories, the forges, the pits, like the black country vernacular in the poem, these are now part of the speaker's history and heritage that they're trying to hold on to. In terms of the world's aspect of the cluster, the use of industries and dialects which are disappearing reflects how the world is changing and how this heritage needs to be preserved and remembered. Berry achieves this through including these things in her poem. At the end, the speaker wants to release the words like pigeons, which in one way is exactly what's happening in this poem. These words fly to us, the reader, on the page. And as to the lives aspect of the cluster, we see how our lives can be enriched by keeping our histories and traditions alive, even as the world around us changes. As Berry explained, So by embracing these words, remembering them, putting them into a poem, passing them forwards. It's a way of lifting up that language and saying, look again. I think it's, it's really beautiful. Now, if you found this video useful, please do subscribe to the channel and give it a thumbs up.